behind it and uh, her tips for making sure that your um, and your this meeting's being recorded as well. So, so I'm gonna hit continue there. Good. So um, so everyone, we uh, we are going to be monitoring the chat as well. So I uh, just want to let you know that uh, if you have any questions during this webinar, I'll be asking you to just type the uh, questions into the chat and I will either leave them for Anne to answer at the end of the webinar or I will answer them for you as we're going. So if um, I want to make sure that uh, people, people know that we're here. So if you can tell me, some of you, if you can type in where you're coming from and where you're viewing us from and all that kind of good stuff, I would appreciate that. Central New Jersey, thank you, James. Ottawa, Canada, Richmond, Riverside. Oh, good. Well, like I said, hello, look at all these people. How wonderful. Well, very, very cool. So, um, just prior to getting us started, um, I want to let you know that um, if you've ever watched a, a NISI webinar before, you will know that we always have a, something a little special for you in terms of, uh, hi, Jim, hello, thank you. Um, we have a special where we give 15% off on anything NISI. The only exception is that we have a lens our 15 millimeter Sunstar lens that unfortunately we can't give 15% off, but we do give 15% off on all other Nisi products. Can I see that slide, please? There we go. And that is your code. And that code is gonna be good until uh, July 25th. So between now and July 25th, just type that code in at the, uh, where it says to enter coupon in your cart or in your checkout and 15% will come off of any Nisi product. And on top of that, we have a new brand that I've been talking about for probably the last couple of months, but we have a brand called Explorer. And Explorer is at this point, primarily a couple of video lights and a couple of really interesting little camera accessories. But this will be a, a, a huge line of camera tripods and camera accessories and all sorts of wonderful things that uh, go along and make your outdoor photography better. And I would really encourage you to go to the explorephotovideo.com site, check out what we have and uh, bookmark it because it's only gonna get better as we uh, get going along. So I see that it is five o'clock and um, if we, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mention one more thing. One more thing, I promise, that's it, and then we'll start. Can I please see the Chris Crosby slide? There we go. Next week, because we're on a roll right now, next week we have uh, another one of our Nisi ambassadors, Chris Ewan Crosby, who will be doing a uh, webinar that I have to say myself, I. Uh, I cleverly came up with. It's called Heidi. What do you do? I can't hear. Hello, Nancy. I need you to turn your mic off, please. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no problem. Don't worry. Um, we have a, a webinar. I said, so Chris, when you go out all the time and you're taking pictures and everything, what if you get out there and it's just a big dud of a day? And he said, yeah, that'd be a good thing to write about and to do a webinar about. So he's going to be doing troubleshooting, what to do when you get in trouble when you're out there and land, doing landscapes and you're at being threatened with coming back with absolutely nothing for your effort. So there you go. Uh, please register and check in for that. But tonight we're going to be doing a webinar, which uh, I did have a hand in crafting uh, because the, the speaker tonight, Ann Strickland, uh, she does photo tours. She will take you anywhere in the world and make sure that you have a great opportunity to take pictures uh, that are off the beaten path. And she's gonna be telling you 
after years of, uh, of leading these tours and traveling and taking pictures for herself, uh, what the pitfalls are to watch out for, and you're gonna learn from her experience. So if all goes well, Anne, it's time for you to come back on. Okay. Hi, Anne. Uh, hi, am I on? You are on and okay. uh, welcome. Say hello to everybody. You've got at least hi, seven everyone. people here. Thank you for coming tonight. We ready to go? We're ready to go. Okay, I'm going to turn off my video to share the sh slides. And I'm gonna make sure you have sound. Do you have sound? I do. There you go, fantastic. Okay. okay. Enjoy folks. Last year, I had been planning a trip to Northern Norway to scout locations for a workshop that we were doing later in the fall and the following spring. We were going to stay for two weeks in Senja and then on to Scotland for two more weeks to scout for another workshop in the Northwest part of the Highlands. The Norway workshop was almost all fully booked and we were so excited to develop our, our itinerary and finally be in Norway in person. A month long trip takes careful planning. And of course uh, we had to book our flights, car rentals, accommodations and so forth. And we had to pay for all of those things ahead of time. The big day finally came and we were off to our adventure exploring Senja. Senja is located in Northern Norway, not far from Lofoten. Senja is less well known than Lofoten, so we're real, we were really especially excited about getting some unique images. We couldn't wait to plant our cameras on location. We arrived in March and the weather is still very wintry. We had big hopes of ca catching the northern lights and beautiful sunrises and sunsets. However, the first three days we were there, we had nearly white out blizzard conditions. And so we didn't get in as much photography as we'd hoped to. But we weren't too worried about the weather conditions at the time because we knew we had two whole weeks there and the snow was going to end soon. This is the location uh, for our workshop. The property is located on this beautiful fjord surrounded by mountains. I took this photo early one morning after a very heavy snowfall the night before. The snow was probably about four feet deep and I'm from Alabama where we never have snow so this was such a big treat for me and I just love the cold weather anyway. Now this is a photo from the owner of the property taken in the summer which is equally stunning. The Brown Building was purposefully built for meetings, so it's the perfect spot to hold a workshop. The owner is a food photographer, and he has four cooking areas where European chefs come and they do food presentations, sort of like the Iron Chef TV show. This is a picture taken from the fjord of the property um, by boat, and also a picture of one of the bedrooms with ensuite bath. Senya is quite remote and there are little options for places to eat, which is a concern when you're taking people out all day for workshops. But we had made arrangements with our host that he would provide breakfast, a sack lunch, and then when we would come home in the evening, dinner would be ready for our group. Um, coming home to a hot meal already prepared is a huge plus when you find yourself coming in from the cold after a long day of shooting landscapes. We were going to cap off our week of photography workshop with our last night being a cooking class where the chef was going to show us how to make a four course Norwegian dinner with wine pairings. Everything exceeded our expectations for our senior workshop and we couldn't wait to show our workshop clients this beautiful part of Norway. However, this workshop never happened. Even with the best laid travel plans, something can go wrong. We never dreamed that the pandemic would interfere with our plans. On our fourth day there, we returned back to our place and the owner said that he had some really bad news for us. Norway was evacuating all foreign tourists from the country and we had to leave immediately. This was on a Saturday night. The airports would be closed to us on Monday morning, so we had to leave the next day. 
I had booked our flights and rental car through a third party travel company. And I tried to contact them to change our flights, but there was no way to get through to them. I guess that thousands of other people were doing the same thing. So we called Scandinavian Airlines to see if they would change the flight for us, but they refused since we had booked through a third party. So note to self, always book directly with the airlines. We were really starting to panic at this point and we didn't know how we were gonna get out of Norway. While I had been trying to change our flight, my partner was looking on Scandinavian's website to find a flight. When he found two seats, he would try to book them, but when he clicked on it, it came back marked sold out. The price of the tickets when he started was $90 each one way, but the price continued to climb. And every time we tried to book our tickets, we got that same sold out message. Finally, we found two first class tickets at $960 each one way to London. By this time, we felt like we had no other option. So we were happy to get those seats. We had a problem with the rental car too. We had paid up front with the third party that was a well-known travel company and they neglected to send the voucher to the car hire company. So when we came to pick up our car, we had to pay the car rental company a much higher amount at the desk when we arrived. We couldn't leave from the same airport, so we had to drive to Tromso the next day, which was six hours away. When we returned the car, they charged, charged us a surcharge of $600 for the returning the car to Tromso. So we had not even left Norway and we had these expensive surprises to our budget. The situation when we arrived at the airport was so different from the situation uh, from our arrival when we came to Norway just four days earlier. For the first time, we saw people in masks and social distancing in the airport, but the plane was packed full. I had three more flights before I made it back home to Alabama. All my flights were jam packed with passengers. I was very worried that I would get COVID-19. Sure enough, a few days after I came home, I started feeling sick and I tested positive for COVID-19. Fortunately, I didn't have that bad of a case and I got over it in a few weeks. My point of this story is that despite your best laid and carefully thought out plans, things can go wrong while traveling. So you need to be flexible and prepared for the unexpected. A little bit about me. My name is Ann Strickland. I have been seriously interested in photography for about 12 years. I've always liked to take pictures, but once I had my first night cam nice camera and I could shoot digitally, there was just no turning back. I started my career as a French teacher. From there, I worked for an attorney as a title researcher, translating documents from French to English. This led me to working for more lawyers until I finally decided to become an attorney myself. Of course, by the time I went to law school, I had three children under seven. So I always do things the hard way and law school is no different. I practiced law for 18 years and then I decided to take a break. And that's when I became interested in photography. I thought I was just taking a break from my law career, but as it turns out, it was a permanent break and I wanted to spend more time with my family and traveling. Photography has opened up my world in ways that I never could have imagined. Studying other landscape photographers' images led me to want to visit many of these places myself. I never dreamed that my photos would grab anyone else's attention or that I would have any sort of career in photography, but I started posting on social media and I got requests to have my work published in print and on online media. And it's always exciting to have your work published. But today I wanna to talk about travel and to introduce you to some of my favorite places to shoot. I will tell you what led me into doing photo tours and workshops as a career path. And almost all the photos that you'll see here today are mine with a few exceptions. You may have already been on a photo tour or workshop or traveled on your own for photography. There are hundreds of great workshops out there for nearly every type of photography that you are interested in. And there are some amazingly talented people teaching them. I want to talk first how I got started doing workshops and tours and show you a few highlights from some of the photography trips that we've taken. 
Then I will spend a little time talking about the pros and cons of workshops versus going out on your own. And finally, I want to share some tips on how to prepare for your photography trip. Now, I'm not a travel guru and I don't have all the answers, but I'm just going to share my experiences today and how I approach things. My goal for you today is to give you some things to consider when you're planning a photo outing, whether with a group or independently. But more than that, I hope that you'll be inspired today to take a trip yourself strictly for photography and soon. Now that COVID appears to be getting under better control, it's really an exciting time to think about traveling. Many countries are still close to us, but I'm hopeful that we can travel freely soon. Everyone has their own thoughts about how to run a photo workshop. I started going on some workshops myself when I first got into photography. I met so many great photographers and people that have become close friends. I still go on workshops sometimes because it's nice to have the plans already made for you. Someone else has done all the work. And I meet a lot of fun people. And more importantly, I generally always learn something new. And there are so many stunning places to explore. The key to a workshop success is organization. It takes a lot of planning behind the scenes to be able to give your client confidence in the experience and most of all, a rewarding time spent with you. Though I don't assist my clients with airfare or other transportation to get to the location, it's still important that they know which airport to get to and other arrangements. We usually suggest that they arrive the day before and stay in an airport hotel, and then we pick up everybody uh, in the morning to head out to our adventure. We do the driving. I always suggest trying to get there at least the day before, especially now traveling is so dicey and um, you want to make sure you have plenty of time in case something goes wrong. The workshop itself is about landscape photography. So I want our clients to have lots of locations that we've previously scouted out so they can get in as much photography as possible. I keep my group small because I wanna be able to help people on location. I like that it's an informal way to teach photography and it's great to learn hands-on in the field. We try to avoid staying in hotels, but rather we look for communal places to stay together like Airbnb houses. That works out well because we can do post-processing together and we get to know each other better in an informal setting. It's just really comfortable and our clients love it. I've done, uh, I've never done a workshop in the United States where I'm from, but I've done workshops in Canada, Italy, and in the UK, and hopefully Norway this year. When I put this slide together, I noticed it's very heavy on coastal locations, though we shoot inland as often. One of the best things about my job is I get to travel to all these beautiful places that you've seen here. I'm going to share some photos from past workshops with you today so that you can better understand what happens on a photography-centered vacation. We get to go to so many stunning places, but my favorite part is the opportunity to meet so many great people from all over who are in different stages of their photography from beginners to advanced photographers. I love showing people these gorgeous places and seeing them get excited about a location. And just love it when they share those shots with me from the back of the camera or on their computer when they get back. And we just have tons of fun during the workshop. It's a great way to travel by yourself too, to be with people who share your passion for photography. The first workshop that I ever did was over 10 years ago in Banff with Canadian photographer, Paul Ziska. And here's Paul right here. You, he's, he's world famous now, but we were just both starting out at this time. And uh, here's our group at Bow Lake. Four of these people have continued to travel with me on other workshops. And one of them has gone on every workshop I've ever had. And they're now my good friends. In fact, after I posted a photo from Banff on Facebook the other day, uh, the lady in the red jacket commented to me, that the photo tour in Banff was the most fun that she had ever had on any trip. Hearing great comments like that is the best reward for me 
And it's what it's all about as a tour leader and planner. And though our trips are centered around landscape photography, we also try to fit in times to experience a bit of the local culture, like on this trip that we did to Tuscany. People bond very quickly on the tour, especially since we can, can um, share these unique experiences together. This is the poster that we used to advertise my first ever workshop that I did with Paul Ziska. I met Paul who lives in Banff the summer before and we went shooting together while I was visiting Banff. One thing led to another and then we decided to do a workshop together. Neither of us had any experience running a workshop but you have to start somewhere at the beginning, right? I had been to several other workshops already and I've always loved planning trips so combining that experience with Paul's wonderful photography skills and his vast knowledge of Banff, we worked hard and we put together a great workshop. To me, Banff is one of the most beautiful places on the, on the planet. So it was easy to sell out this workshop. But I realize now that we were very lucky straight out of the gate because there are so many workshops out there to choose from. So selling out our first workshop was a very lucky break for us. Here's another photo of Bow Lake, which is probably one of my favorite spots in Banff. There are so many different com uh, compositions to be had here and the light is always spectacular. It's really hard to take a bad shot here. Okay, time for a commercial. One thing about traveling for photography is that to get your money's worth, you want to get in as many shots as you can, which means that you often have to shoot during the day, not just the golden hours of sunrise and sunset. Now, I admit that I'm addicted to my filters and I probably use them 90% of the time when I'm out shooting. I love the effects that I get and how the filters help me control light. I took this photo uh, that you see at Emerald Lake during midday. The light was very bright and there was a glare on the water. But I used my circular polarizer here along with my 10 stop filter to control the light, reduce the glare and to bring out the beautiful colors of the lake and the sky. So it's always good to have them with you to help you shoot during the daytime when the light may not always be optimal. Also, this may be your only chance to shoot at a certain location, so you may want to be able, you always want to be able to get your best shot. I love Scotland. I've been going to Scotland for many years and have been there at least 13 times by my count. And one of my friends who lives on Sky once said that I'm like a local and that just made my day, but I do feel that I know Sky very well. And going back there is always a bit like going home to me. We've done several photo tours in the Scottish Highlands. And this is the ad for the last tour that I did there in 2019. We had more photo trips planned for 2021 and 2022 to Scotland. But as you know, COVID put all these trips on hold for a while. And unfortunately we had to cancel all of our tours. But my first workshop in Sky was in 2012. We had a great group of guys from all over the world and everyone became fast friends as I recall. My partner in this workshop had brought his girlfriend along who was a trained French chef. She cooked most of our meals and we had fine dining meals cooked for us every night after shooting. She even met us at the top of the old man of store one morning with a hot breakfast and fresh orange juice. Now, if you've ever climbed the old man's store, you know that it's a steep, rocky path. And I have no idea how she beat us up to the top carrying all that food. But you know how we photographers are, we get into a zone when we're shooting and we're not paying any attention to anything else. So I'm sure she passed us right by. This is the view from uh, looking down from the rugged area of sky called the Quarang. We rented two houses for the week to use as our home base in sky. And our homes were located right here in this area. 
We split the group in two and my partner hosted one house and I hosted the other one. The houses were very near to each other at this seaside location with the view of the Quarang. This is one of the houses for that trip and typical of what we like to use for our groups. We all met in this one for meals and for camera talk at the end of the day. Uh, this particular group was in the, one of the first stops that they wanted to make was the Tower Whiskey District. And so they always enjoyed a nightcap together of Scotch whiskey. This charming little picture postcard shot is Portree, the largest town on Sky. It's a great place to use as a base for food and supplies since it's centrally located on the island. And it's also a good place to pick some fish and chips. I think that we were very lucky to have so many rain show up in this. World. This one happened in the middle of the day and it went on for at least an hour. I remember I even got tired of shooting it, it went on for so long. One of the highlights of Sky is the Fairy Pools, which is a series of waterfalls that goes up a mountain path, which you have to cross a few little streams to get here. That is not my favorite part because you, there are stepping stones that you have to hop on. And I'm just not, uh, my legs aren't long enough and I just hope I don't fall. I haven't fallen yet, but I've always gotten wet feet here. And you, I took this a video snippet here during a heavy rainstorm so you can see how challenging the weather was. Here's the result. I'm not entirely pleased with it, uh, so it's a good excuse to get back there again and shoot under better conditions, hopefully not under a thunderstorm. Elgol is another place that's iconic on Sky, and it's a must stop for any landscape photographer. On the way to Elgol, though, you pass this pretty little lake, and it's filled with golden grasses, and it's a great place to stop if you're headed to Elgol. And one thing about Sky is that there's always landscape photography drama and lots of rain. Preparation is very important for a photography trip. It's not something that you think about perhaps, but it's always good to tuck a cloth in your camera bag to wipe off water when shooting seascapes and waterfalls. And so we send a checklist to everyone so they'll make sure to have everything that they might need for shooting seascapes. Um, here is a little video of a large group at Talisman Bay. This is my photo from that night. This particular week in Scotland was one of the rainiest on record, super wet even by Scotland standards, but we had a fantastic sunset this night at Talisker Bay. It was the only colorful sunset that we'd had that week. Um, I posted this photo online after the trip and I was really excited because it was picked up by Scotland Magazine and published in one of their recent issues. And I'm going to show you just a few more photos from Scotland. Uh, this is the Quarang. It's a great place to shoot because there are so many grand landscapes. Um, and the Quarang is just a classic landscape photographer's location. Um, when I first started going to Sky uh, back in 1998, uh, there was hardly any traffic and it was just a single track road and you didn't see, you could go for a long time and not see anyone. But now you'll go up to this remote place and it's just covered with photographers, but you can see why it's just beautiful. It's a great place to shoot any time of year, but I need to warn you of the dreaded midges in the summer. They'll eat you alive. Um, I bought midge net hoods for everyone um, in our group this on this trip, and I gave them out at the beginning of the workshop. But I think they thought that they were gag gifts at first. But I noticed that we went out um, shooting and the midges started biting us and they all put them over their head. Um, 
And I know you look pretty silly with these things on, but these midges are ferocious. They're like flying teeth. Another one of my favorite places is Italy. I was fortunate to go there one summer with my parents when I was 14, and I've been back many times since then. I absolutely love it. And in fact, I'm returning to Italy in early August. I just can't wait. We had so much fun on our workshop in Tuscany. This particular time, we had a wonderful group, mostly Americans, but we had some guys join us from Kuwait that week. And so we had a chance to learn about their culture as well as Italian culture. We stayed in the little town of Pienza and shot the surrounding rural countryside of the Val d'Orcia. Italy is another place where you can just fill up tons of memory cards. Nearly everywhere you turn is a beautiful picture postcard. The landscapes are so perfect that they, they look like a movie set to me. This is a photo that I took of our group one morning when we were shooting the sunrise over the iconic valley where the Belvedere Villa is located. It's a photographer classic. What I love about uh, this photo is the look on the face of the client sitting on the grass. He just stopped photographing the scene and he sat down and watched the sunrise. I loved that he took the time to savor the scene unfold. I think that he fell in love with Italy right then and there because he left the US and he moved to Tuscany the following year and now it's his forever home. This is the scene that he was looking at. You've probably seen it before. Here's a side story for you. Um, just below that hill where we were shooting is a pig pen and it's filled with running pigs. So you hear them while you're shooting and worse, you smell them. And it, so it kind of takes away a bit of the romance of this extraordinary landscape. Now, you can't go to Italy and not sample the wonderful food. I love to cook. And sometimes I'll cook a meal on the workshops for everyone. And we went to the market in Florence and I cooked a pasta dish for some of us. Um, and here's my dish. One of the benefits of staying together in an Airbnb is that we can cook meals together. As you guys know, the best time for evening light is also the best time for dinner time. So it's nice to come back and relax together, chill out and cook up a nice little supper together. Of course, we went out for dinner too. Because the restaurants are usually small in our locations, we pre-book lunch and dinner before the workshop starts, uh, dictated by where we'll be shooting nearby. Um, our lodging fixed our breakfasts. So when we, uh, we usually left about 5 a.m. to go shoot and they had prepared our lunches the or breakfast the night before. So we just grabbed a bag and went. But when you have a group of 10 or so people, it's not always easy to just pop into a restaurant unannounced for meals. So planning ahead is essential. People who like to do uh, food photography with their iPhones will love Italy. We stayed in a 13th century villa nestled in the middle of an olive grove, which had 12 bedrooms. So everyone could have their own room and bath like you see here. There was maid service every day, so it was great to come in after a day of shooting to, the, to a tidy room. The place was just lovely and so typically Tuscan. A few of our guests brought their spouses or friends. The owner of the villa uh, helped us arrange a driver to entertain them during the day and they had so much fun too. They went to a wine tasting, a truffle festival, shopping, and they even picked olives and bottled their own olive oil to bring home. There was a chef on site and a small restaurant in the villa exclusively closed for our group. So we could have meals in the communal room following a day of shooting. The chef also did a cooking class with our non-photographers who came with us. I apologize for this fuzzy picture, um, but I wanted to show you how we put the tables together in the evenings. We opened up our laptops and sat around looking at our shots from the day, sharing stories, did some photo editing, 
and I think that we may have drank a glass of wine or two or three. Now this poster is from our workshop in Cornwall, England. By this point in time, I was a Nisi ambassador. Nisi has been very generous and they can provide sets of filters for our guests to try out for themselves. The Cornish coast is a wonderful place to try out your skills with long exposure photography. The Cornish coast is just absolutely stunning. One of my favorite places to shoot. You may be familiar with the TV show Poldark. It's filmed in Cornwall and it showcases some of the wonderful scenery. The landscapes are just legendary and you won't be disappointed in the variety of compositions that you can shoot. Here's a little bit of a live view to give you a flavor of the coast. Whoops. Looks like my slides have gone away from me here. It's so beautiful and rugged. Um, and though it can be very rainy in England, most of the times that I've been to Cornwall, the sky has been brilliant and there are opportunities for some stunning coastal sunsets. But again, sometimes you can only be at a certain location during the day. This location is called Bedruth and Steps. There are some amazing rock st stacks and formations that are fun to shoot on the beach. And you access the beach from a, from a cliff top by taking some steep stairs, about 300 steps. And you can only go down there at low tide. Otherwise, the tide is so high, it covers even tall rocks you see here. Um, at this time of day, uh, we did get to go down to the beach, but the atmosphere was so hazy and there was a glare on the water, as you can see here in front of my camera. We checked the tide times and we knew there would be a high tide at sunset. So we could shoot the sunset here from the cliff top. So my only opportunity to shoot on the beach was to shoot around noon. Again, the filter saved the day for this shoot by eliminating the haze and the water glare. Another of my favorite locations is Dorset, England on the South Coast. Until I'd been there myself, I'd never even heard of Dorset but I've been there so many times now that I know it well. The coastline is absolutely stunning and dramatic, but the interior of the country, of the county is equally beautiful too. There's a huge variety of locations to pick from. One of Dorset's icons is Corf Castle, which is a 16th century ruin. It was built on the highest spot in the area so that the castle occupants could see who was coming. It's perfect for photographers because there's a hill opposite the ruins and at certain times of the year, the mist comes into the valley for some strikingly dramatic photography opportunities. Here are the guys in place to shoot and waiting for the mist to clear uh, with their cameras ready to go at sunrise. Here's a shot that I've taken of Corf in the midst, mist. As you can see, there's not too much left of the castle, which was once owned by Henry VIII, but that's what makes it so hauntingly beautiful to me. Corf is also a great place for shooting colorful sunsets too, sunrises, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a lot to offer at this location, and you can see why it's such a popular place for local photographers and for visitors like us. Dorset Sturtle Door is an awesome place to shoot too. You can access the beach by some stairs that you can't see that are right about here. Um, it's best shot though from the bluff in my opinion. Uh, we had to get up around 2.30 a.m. to get here. Um, we weren't staying very far away, but there probably is a mile or so walk to get to this point. Um, this image was taken about 4 a.m. and the sun had already started to rise. The sun rises super early in England in the summer 
And I have to admit, I'm not a morning person, but once I'm out, I'm really happy to shoot beautiful sunrises, especially like this. And there are a variety of compositions around Dural Door. Uh, this was taken on the other side, just opposite the big rock form formation that you saw. Not only are there great seascapes in Dorset, but there are some cool places to shoot in rural Dorset. This barn is called the Dutch Barn or Six Penny Handley, and uh, it's a local photographer favorite. The farmer generously lets photographers wander about the field. And I think that the farmer tries to tempt them too because he rotates the crops. And so there's always some new crop planted to make this fresh and an interesting place to shoot. Not far from Dirtle Door are the stunning limestone cliffs, Old Hairy Rocks. So you can hit both of these locations easy for sunrise. One of the great things about shooting in Dorset is that there's so many fantastic places to shoot within a relatively small geographic area. So you don't spend a lot of time driving around from place to place and wear yourself out that way. So you can come home with just tons of pictures um, from those great cliffs and uh, interior viewpoints. Now that we've looked at some beautiful locations, I hope that you're thinking about taking a photography trip soon yourself. Workshops and photo tours are a wonderful and a productive way to get a lot of photography in with a fun group of people. All the hard work has been done for you so you can concentrate on getting those shots that you've been dreaming about. As I said earlier, it's a good way to travel alone too, to shoot with other people if your partner doesn't enjoy photography. And you'll learn so much and you have a chance to improve your, your skills. Not all workshops are alike and some are better run than others. So you need to be careful when choosing one. You're spending a lot of money for the workshop. So you should do your homework when choosing one to get the most from your investment. Here are a few pointers and things to look for when researching a potential workshop. Look for someone who is a good teacher as well as a good photographer. Someone who will work with you and not spend all their time on location, on their phone or shooting themselves with their camera. Ask lots of questions up front, get referrals if possible and get a checklist from the workshop shop leader letting you know what to bring and what to expect. Ask yourself, what are your goals and what do you expect to take away from the experience? The workshop leader should have a plan B and even plan C and D. For example, I've never had a workshop that didn't involve some weather challenges. So if the weather is too inclement to get out or if you're snowed in, what are the alternative plans? Be sure that you're comfortable with the accommodations and the transportation arrangements. Some workshop operators require that you drive yourself from spot to spot. Make sure you're okay with that. Factoring in rent, fact, you must factor into renting a car into the cost of a workshop like that. Um, finally, a fun guide can make the workshop into a memorable experience for you. You're going to be spending at least a few days with them. So a warm, easygoing personality is important. I love to travel alone or with friends for photography trips. You have to do the planning yourself, but you travel when it's convenient for you. Most landscape workshops will take you to the iconic spots of the area and you wanna to go to those. And if time permits, maybe some secret or lesser known spots, but going alone gives you the chance to take your time and change gears if you come across something really special. You are in control and it's also less expensive. Both workshops and, and, and independent tours make great photography travel. And you can weigh both options and decide what works best for you or do both. I'll take, uh, let you take a minute to look over the considerations uh, for a successful photo trip. The list is not exhaustive and it, you may tailor your own list to your specific needs or type of photo trip that you're going on. Sometimes I make quick plans and then I'm off. But if I have more time, I get better prepared. 
a checklist. Is <coughs> not so you won't forget anything. Think carefully about where you're shooting and what camera gear you'll need to get the shots you want. Consider what kind of clothing you'll need to take. You may not have everything you need and you may need to shop for an it for in advance. So planning is the key. I'm not gonna talk about everything on this list due to time, but I'll, I'll hit upon a few of them. Everyone asks, well, what kind of camera gear are you carrying? Um, I don't travel with a lot of gear. Everyone is different and some people will bring everything that they own. What gear you bring depends on what you're going to shoot so you need to think ahead about that and bring the proper lens. If you need a special lens just for the trip that you don't already own, you can always rent one uh, just before you leave. If you don't have a backup camera, you can also rent that or borrow one. I haven't needed a backup camera yet myself, but I can't tell you how many cameras I've seen fall into the water or even over a cliff. And it can spoil your whole photography trip if you don't have a camera. How much gear you bring also depends on your transportation mode. If you're on a road trip and there's room in the car, you can bring a lot more with you. But if you're flying to a location, there are weight limits and you have to carry everything with you on the plane. Furthermore, if you'll be hiking to some locations on your trip, you may not want to be carrying a heavy camera bag. If you're going on a workshop and riding together at a group, consider that space is very limited vehicle. And sometimes luck has to be packed into the vehicle as well. So pack light. As you probably have already figured out for yourself, photography can be a very expensive hobby. When putting together your photography travel budget, you will think about the things that I have listed here. Incidentals can hit you hard because sometimes unexpected things happen, like what happened to me on my last trip to Norway. I was able to get back some of what I had paid ahead returned to me, but in the end, I lost about $2,000 more than I expected. So it was a very expensive four days in Norway. Level of fitness. If you are planning a trip that will involve a lot of walking, hiking, etc., and you aren't in shape for it, Take the time before the trip to get into shape so that you'll better enjoy the trip. This lady here, who I shall call Ann, is an example of how important it is to know your limits. This is me getting ready to hike some of the Appalachian Trail. I have a 50 pound backpack on that I'm not used to carrying, as well as a brace on my knee, which was injured, injured on another photography trip. Two days later, I was carried down the trail thrown over the shoulder of a college student uh, who found me in the dark on the trail with a sprained ankle and I couldn't walk. Uh, we called ahead and a rescue crew met us and they transported me the rest of the five miles to an ambulance waiting for me at the bottom. I was on crutches for two weeks. Don't be like Ann, know your limits. Another list that you should make is for clothing appropriate to the area you're traveling to. If you're flying, bear in mind that your luggage is limited and winter gear is just more bulky. I always bring at least two pairs of waterproof boots and socks when I shoot in cold weather. I always get my feet wet and I appreciate having a second pair of dry boots. This is me shooting in Iceland. I really love to shoot in cold places. In fact, I think they're my favorite but the weather can be very harsh and challenging. Um, besides my fingers getting cold when I'm shooting, I never get cold anywhere else because I'm prepared for the weather and I can, con can concentrate on shooting, not on shivering. Packing for warm weather locations is just much easier for me. Uh, but remember that some locations can be very warm during the day, but they get chillier at night. So don't forget to bring something appropriate. I was recently in Breckenridge, Colorado in June and the first day we were there it snowed and I'd only brought a hoodie. Uh, so I wasn't prepared myself. So check the weather for both day and night before you go to pack appropriately.
you can uh, reach me on Instagram or Facebook, or you can email me um, at uh, thelandscapeloop at gmail.com. Um, we are in the process of starting a new travel company that I'm really excited about. And um, we are, we'll have our website up in two or three weeks. It's going to be called The Landscape Connection. And uh, it'll be the www.thelandscapeconnection.org. And if you want to uh, get on the mailing list, you can shoot me an email at thelandscapeloop at gmail.com. Um, thanks to Jim and everybody at NISI for inviting me to speak to you today. I hope that uh, you're inspired to do some travel photography yourself and not just talk about having a bucket list, but actually booking that flight and getting out there. There's some beautiful places in the world. Thank you all for being here today. Jim, I'll hand it over to you. Well, you're not off the hook yet because I'm sure <laughs> there's got to be some questions, but I am. Um... I am. Uh, I enjoyed every minute of your presentation. Oh, thank I hope you. Other people did as well. And um, you know, at this point, if people would like to pop on, turn on their camera, turn on their mic, and ask a question, I'll try and keep it under control. But you guys are welcome to do that at this point. And uh, or I have a chat to add to. Um, to uh, answer any questions as well. So I leave it to you. I guess I am gonna also throw in there, please don't forget that if there is any gear that you need from Nisi or from Explorer Photo and Video that uh, if you use the uh, coupon code, which I need to be reminded of, Jason. <laughs> Jason. Um, there it is. It's coming soon. Yes. Live 15 and and with an E. Yes. So, but um, our participants were all there. They all stayed there. I thought it was wonderful. Um, we'll have a little chat hopefully tomorrow offline. Okay. But I'm giving people, I was in Norway with Lofton. I was in Norway, Lofton and Sinja reading with Ka. Oh, Kawhi Lin. Right, right, okay. Pam? Kawhi Lin? You know Kawhi, don't yes. you? Yes. I, yeah. I was there with Kawhi and William Yu for two weeks. And we just got home the middle of February of 2020. So we just made it in time, mm -hmm. you know, before they locked everything down. We, yes. we, just, we just missed you then, Pam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we were there for two weeks and did not see any auroras, if you can believe that. No, I can because I've been to Norway and Iceland during the peak aurora times and I've never seen it. <laughs> I could not believe it in that. And the next week they had lots of them. It was very strong. It's oh, kind of a bummer, but that's the oh way, well. isn't it? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> and then uh, Mahana says Loftalin. Oh, okay. Loftalin is on my bucket list, winter or summer, or anytime. So Lisa wants to know what's planned for fall of 2021, Ann? Well, I hope Norway will get back on the schedule. Um, I'm really more concentrating on uh, next spring. Um, it's, it's, I wanted to put Scotland back on the menu, but even today, uh, the UK's uh, Delta variant is going up. And I have a very good friend that's a doctor, and he said, things are really getting in. So that's news. Um, and right now, really travel to the UK can go, but you quarantine for 10 days. Uh, so there are not many people that can afford to just sit in a hotel for 10 days. Um, so once that opens back up, we'll, we'll add Scotland back in. And I want to do another tour in uh, Italy as well. I need to figure out a way to uh, make it that the Nisi representative has to go with you to Italy. <laughs> it sounds great. <laughs> exactly. Well, all right. Um, if anybody else has questions, now's your time. Otherwise, we're going to wrap up another wonderful webinar. Uh, it will also be available on our way on our Nisi Optics USA uh, YouTube channel. If you care to uh, review it again and 
uh, pick up on some of the things that Ann told you. Your information was incredible. It was beautifully presented. And uh, I, I, oh, are you going to Banff again? I would be willing to bet she's going to go to Banff. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I will watch your website for, okay. yeah, because um, I would really like, I've always wanted to go there. And it's fairly close for us on the West Coast. Okay, where do you live, Pam? I, I live on um, Northern California by the Oregon border on the coast. Oh, okay. You live in a beautiful place to shoot. Yes, yes. But it's always fun to, you know, go elsewhere. It is. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just up in the Palouse with uh, Kauai and William. Oh, okay. I love the Palouse. I that, it was beautiful. Yeah, it's it's gorgeous. I just didn't know. You said that you really don't do many in the in the U.S. Is that true? Well, that's one of the things that's about to change. Oh, um, so uh, I'm not giving away too much at this point in time uh, okay. because we're still putting it together. But uh, we should have everything out. Um, I want to. I want to say it's going to be one to two weeks, but it'll probably be more like three weeks. My trip to Croatia and Italy are intervening, so it's difficult to work from there. Okay. Well, we'll just keep an eye on your schedule. Okay. Thank. You. Okay. Thank you. All right then. So listen, I'm going to wrap it up, and again, we'll talk offline tomorrow or the next okay. day. Okay. Thank you so much. I think it's a huge success. I'm here. I would love to do a photography trip with Ann Willie. There she is. I would love to get in touch with her. Keep in touch, Willie. All right. Good night, everyone, and thank you again for participating. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.